Hey, how you doing? You guys happy to be in church this morning? Amen, amen. My name is Miles, I'm the pastor of The Rock. Why don't you, uh, let's see your Bibles this morning. Word, Word. let's see your pens. And your lesson plan. Amen. Let's turn to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16. Luke. Luke. I am your father. Did anybody see the new uh, Star Wars movie? Was it any good? How many people saw it? Was it any good? How many people say no? How many people say yes? Okay, that's good. There's nothing like the first one. Luke 16. It is good to be back in home from all this traveling. I tell you, we went, my, my, my sister lives in the Caribbean, and her husband is the minister of tourism. It's not a church. It's a, uh, it's like the Department of Tourism. They call it the Ministry of Tourism, and he's the director of the minister, so that makes him the minister. So he's got all the hookups with the hotels and stuff, and we went there and stayed there for six days with parents and, you know, 16 of us, cousins, nephews, nieces, etc. And one night we got to stay on this catamaran. We went out and we went to uh, spend the night in the boat and go snorkeling at these different places. So right before we went to all these places to snorkel, one of which my father had already been and verified that it was a great spot, and it's, you know, it's one of the most popular spots down there, this other captain of another boat said, I know where you're going, but there's another place you need to go that's better. And I'm sitting in my mind, well, how come they didn't tell us that? And he said, this place that, that I'm telling you to go has turtles and stingrays. And you are not going to see that. You're going to see a lot of fish, but you're not going to see turtles and stingrays at this other place. They're not taking you. I'm like, man, I want to see turtles and stingrays. I just finished talking to my wife that I wanted to swim with turtles and stingrays, kind of hang on their back and do that kind of stuff. They weren't that kind, but that was kind of like my, one of my passions to swim with big stuff, you know, sharks and, you know, whales and stuff like that. So, he, you know, I figured this was step one. So I said, listen, I want to go to that place. So I went to the captain of our boat and said, look, this guy said that, you know, there was turtles and stingrays at this beach, and I don't know why we're not going there, and it's running away, and, you know, I don't want to go there. He's like, well, look, I, I've been down there 20-something years. I ain't, ain't nothing over there. And, you know, where you're going is the best spot. I said, look, I still want to go there. So, you know, I you know, went around the boat and said, look, we want to go to this spot. So we were driving by or uh, sailing by it anyway. So we went to the spot that we were supposed to go to first. He said, let's go there first, and I know you're going to get good fish, and it was great. It was an unbelievable fish. We actually did see a stingray there. We actually did see a turtle there, but mostly just all these amazing fish. We got to swim in this cave, and when you went into the cave, there was like a whole school of these little minnows or little tiny baby somethings and just <laughs> baby daddies. I don't know what they're called, but it's just billions of them, and you swam right through them, and it just like a cloud of all these fish. It was orange coral. And matter of fact, this family came by us, and they were feeding the fish, and so they had about 200 fish like this big, swimming around them eating this stuff that later we found out might not have been food it might have been stuff coming out of this diaper but we didn't know it was a we, we didn't kind of figure that out we didn't want to think about it so we just kind of swam behind them and you know swam in all these fish and it was just unbelievable big barracuda came by a boat like about five feet long so we jumped in the water taking pictures of him and he had these nasty gnarly teeth and so we had a great time so i said look this is the spot the guy said this is the spot i was telling, telling you about this is, this is the best spot I said, I still want to go to that other beach that other guy was talking about. Because it's kind of on the way home. And it really was. It was, you know, it was right over there. So <laughs> we go over there. And I'm like, yeah, I'm getting ready to see these sea turtles and these stingrays. I'm telling you, I probably saw about five fish <laughs> dead, just floating. <laughs> there was no stingrays. There was no turtles. There was barely any fish. I'm swimming around going, I'm all excited, swimming, whoa, 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 and there's nothing, nothing. I want you to look in your notes. We're going to start a series called True Religion. It says in your notes, a true religion can be defined as a system of beliefs and practices designed to lead someone into a relationship with the supernatural. A major focus of many religions is often life after death. True Religion is a series designed to investigate how true the beliefs and promises are for some of the most common practices. In four weeks, we're going to talk about Catholicism. I know many of y'all are Catholic or have come out of Catholicism. I came out of Catholicism. We're not going to bash Catholic people, but we're going to talk about some of the 
the, the things you are taught in Catholicism that you shouldn't do based on the Bible. We're going to talk about Islam. Next week, we're going to talk about scientificology. Today, we're going to talk about Buddhism. Buddhism is a very, uh, has a very interesting theology. Once you reach nirvana or a state of no suffering in Buddhism, a state of perfect peace, salvation, if you will, your reward is nothing. You cease to exist. Now, if I told you we're going to go snorkeling and we're going to go to a beach, we're going to take a nice ride, it's going to be nice sun, nice water, and you're going to get a tan on the way, and when you get there, there's going to be nothing there, would you go? In Buddhism, when you get to the end of the wheel of life and you, and you, and you uh, get to a place of nirvana where you, you've conquered all your suffering and you've reached perfect peace, you are rewarded with nothing. You cease to exist. That's what Buddhism is all about. Uh, Buddha was born in 563 B.C., born the son of a king, and he went on a quest to find the answer to life's problems. He went on a, a quest to find peace and meaning, and he discovered that life was nothing but an endless cycle of pain. If you look in your notes, one, it says it's hopelessly suicidal to view life as an endless cycle of useless suffering and sorrow. What we're going to look at is a, is a parable in the Bible. Not a, it's not a parable. It's a story in the Bible. Parables don't have formal names. This story is about a man named Lazarus and a rich man. Lazarus is poor. The rich man is rich. And in this story, we're going to learn some principles that contradict the principles of Buddhism. Now, again, some of you may be Buddhist or you may believe in some of these Eastern religion beliefs, like reincarnation we're going to talk about in a minute, uh, nirvana, karma we're going to talk about in a minute. You may believe in some of that stuff, and that's fine. You have to understand, in cults and religions, there's usually an element of truth. There's usually an element of truth in almost everything. Even if someone tells you that you are the ugliest person in the world, you may not be the ugliest person, and all of us have been told that once uh, at some point in our life. If you haven't, I'll tell you now. You're the ugliest person in the world. <laughs> don't be offended by it. It's not true, because I don't know everybody in the world to be able to say that. But there's probably some truth in it. We all got some ugly to us. Amen? Okay. None of us are perfect in all ways. You're the stupidest person in the world. You've been told that by one of your brothers and sisters. Amen? Yeah, you may not be the stupidest person in the world. I don't even know if stupidest is a word, but the most stupid. But there's some truth in it probably. You've probably got some stupidity to you. Amen? Okay, so, so when you hear stuff about a religion that says, yes, th that life is an endless cycle of suffering, there is some truth to that. You will suffer your whole life. You will have disappointment. Your whole life. You will. When Christ said he completed God's job, what was he doing? Suffering. He was in intense pain. If you remember, he was on the cross. And when he said, I finished, I've completed the mission. Well, in Buddhism, he was a complete failure because he was suffering the most when he said that. He had not come to the place of nirvana. He was, he was being crucified as a criminal. If anything, he went backwards. Because that's not true. What I mean by that's not true. Truth is not overcoming suffering, like the Buddhists will tell you. Let's read the story. Chapter 16, verse 19, it says, There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fed sumptuous every day. Purple was a very expensive clothing. Uh, it was the clothing of kings, uh, purple, because purple was very difficult to make. So he had on Gucci, Armani, whatever kind of clothes you think are purple. And then he had... Nice food every day. He ate good. And then it says there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who laid at the gate designed to be fed with crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked the sores, uh, his sores. If you ever want to see someone with sores, go downtown, feed, sit, and speak with someone who is homeless. And anyone who's been homeless for an extended period of time, you will see have sores on their body. This Lazarus had sores that were leaking pus. They were infected. That's why the dogs were licking them. They were cleaning them. So not only did he have sores, but he was too weak and probably beat down to, let, to shoo the dogs away that they licked his sores. And he was desiring to eat the crumbs that fell off the rich man's table. Rich people at that time would take chunks of bread and wipe their hands and, and, and mouths like a napkin with bread 
and throw it to the ground. This guy just wanted to eat that. So you got one guy who's rich, got it going on, and in this story, he's pretty comfortable. And the other guy is suffering. So there is suffering. Just because there's suffering in the world doesn't make Buddhism true. It just makes that statement true. And what you have to understand something is that you learn more through suffering than pleasure. When you go through hard times, when you go through change in your life, when you go through difficult times, you will learn and grow closer to God more than you will when everything's comfortable. Now, we live in a life in a world where we always want to avoid pain and suffering at all costs. Well, that's not biblical. What's biblical is that you trust God and walk with God by faith. And I guarantee you, when you walk with God, you will experience discomfort. But in our society, it's like, don't do anything, don't, don't do anything that's going to be risky. I don't want to get risk being embarrassed. I don't want to get risk being uncomfortable. I don't want to risk change and the unknown. That's not biblical. That's just tradition. It's not biblical. I was talking to a pastor. I meet with this pastor. We've met twice. He's, two, he's 25 years old. He has a church two years old. We met three months ago, and he says, would you mind meeting with me on a quarterly basis? I said, fine. As long as you do the homework I give you, we'll meet. If you stop doing the homework, we're not going to meet. So I said, hey, it's okay. So we met the other day. I said, what, you, what kind of questions do you have? He says, I want to know how to take the church to the next level. I said, what does the next level mean to you? He says, I want everything to be like on autopilot, just self-perpetuating. I said, you want stuff to be easy. You want to get rid of all the, the, the grind. Because the first thing he said to me when he saw me, it's hard. And I said, welcome to reality. I mean, they don't teach you in seminary the stuff that's hard. They teach you theory. And you get out of seminary, then you can, or college for that matter, then you can learn real life. I said, let me tell you something, young fella. When your church gets to these, these many people, and then these many people, you will have more problems, more attack. You will be criticized more often. You will be wrong more often. You will be the target of everyone's jokes and criticisms more often. So I just need to warn you, you're never going to get to that place where that stuff stops. It's going to get worse and worse and worse. Do you still want to do this? That's life. You will never, ever, ever, ever get to a place where your pain and suffering and disappointment ends until you get to heaven. Get over it. And accept it. Don't make a big deal about it. Your car gets stolen, you get another one. You lose your job, you get another one. You lose your toe, deal with it. You ain't getting another one. You can get a fake one. If you're taking notes, write down James chapter 1, verse 2 to 4. He says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And that patience have its perfect work, makes you complete, lacking nothing. When you fall into a trial and something bad happens, you should go, something, I'm going to learn out of this. I'm going to grow out of this. Not, oh, i got to do everything I can to avoid this. Let me ask you to consider the things that you do and do, don't do just because you want to avoid discomfort. Don't live that way. You're cheating yourself out of life. The only way you're going to please God is by faith. It's impossible to please God without faith. And faith is walking in the unknown. It's walking in the unknown. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things unknown. I don't know. And people sometimes will ask you as a Christian, why are you doing that? Or what's going to happen? It's okay to say, I don't know. When we started our building project, I take, can't tell you how many times people ask me, how are you going to pay for that? I say, I don't know. <laughs> I know it will happen, but I don't know how. But I know who? God. You know what? That's a biblical response. That's a, once you start saying, well, let me tell you how it's going to happen. You're going to do this, 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 this. Unless God told you that very clearly, uh, uh, you better be quiet. Because God will say, is that right? And God will say, go ahead and do it. I want to see. And it won't happen. It won't happen. Let me tell you something. Life is about struggle. Life does have disappointment because we deal with sinners. And we're all sinners. More wicked than we want to accept. And so this concept of Buddha saying that life, life is an endless, thing, uh, uh, endless cycle of, of pain and suffering, it is true. It doesn't make his whole theology true. Number two, 
It's hopelessly suicidal to view salvation as nirvana, N-I-R-V-A-N-A, -A, the complete end of your existence. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation is the last book in the Bible, and the second 21 is the second to last chapter. So the second to last chapter in the whole Bible, verse 1. Now, I want you, to, to, I want you to, to, to track this with me. Many people say, well, everyone should believe what they want to believe because all roads lead to God. If you're a Buddhist today or you know a Buddhist, just think about this for a minute. And there's many different strands of Buddhism also. It, it, there's no one set theology. Uh, what Buddha taught was not written down until 300 years after he died. And then it was started morphing and morphing. Uh, and, and Jesus, by the way, everything written about Jesus in the Bible was written in the lifetime of eyewitnesses. Big difference. So, but in general, Buddha said, you have this endless cycle of reincarnation that we're going to talk, to talk about next. But when you get to the end where you reach nirvana, where you're at peace, and you've conquered your suffering, you've learned to deal with it, you cease to exist. You're no more. Poof, the magic dragon, gone. You're gone. Now, if you're a Buddhist... And that's fine with you. You don't want to go to heaven. You can believe that. But here's the catch. It doesn't mean that's really what's going to happen. I mean, I could believe all my life when I walk out the door today, someone's going to hand me a check for $30 million and not for the rock, just for my own pleasure. <laughs> this is just for you. I can believe it all I want. It ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. And if you're, if you're out there and you want to do that, just put in an offering and make it to the rock. Don't give it to me. But that ain't just because I believe it and want it and am dedicated to it. Let me tell you what's really going to happen. Chapter 21, verse 1. It says, Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth, earth shall pass away, and there was no more sea. And then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We get weddings from the Bible. It's a metaphor for Christ and his church. Christ is the groom, the church is the bride. Verse 3, I heard a loud voice from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people. God himself, everyone say God himself, will be with them and their God, and God will wipe away every tear from every eye, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying, no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And he who sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. Write these things, for they are true and faithful. Now, you can say, well, that's fine for you Christians to believe that. I believe in Buddha. Well, the difference you have, to, you have to ask yourself is, what is the credibility of a man who died and never claimed to be God, and 300 years after he died, they wrote some things about him, versus God himself who wrote and said these things died and rose from the dead, and it is still alive to testify to their truth. And what God is saying is, I want to offer you eternal life. Read all the writings of Buddha. Meditate all day long, but don't hope in something that is nothing. Don't have an expectant desire that in the end, when you perfect it, you die for all eternity, never to exist again. I call it hopeless suicide. You are expecting to kill yourself. That's all it is. Instead, you should have an expectant desire, or, or what's, uh, what's offered to you is an expectant desire to have eternal life where God himself will wipe away your tear, where there is no more pain, no sorrow. Now we're talking about in heaven. There's no more pain, no more sorrow. We live on a fallen earth. Let me tell you something. The Caribbean is beautiful. Skiing, which I don't do, is beautiful. Surfing and, and skydiving and all. The, we, have a, we have a beautiful earth. But this is the ghetto version of heaven. This is. I mean, if you can imagine that. You know, the ocean covers two-thirds of the earth. It gives us 70% of our oxygen. The ocean does. The average depth of the ocean is two miles deep. The valleys in the ocean are bigger than the valleys above the ocean. In other words, the valleys are bigger than the mountains you see on earth, if you can believe that or not. The ocean is huge. God says, I don't need that in my next life. That's, that, that stuff is all that's old passe. It's like, it's like all those old computers where you had to put the card in. I don't need the ocean anymore. I got a whole new deal in heaven. This is what he offers you and me. This is the hope he gives us. A hope is an expectant desire. Christmas Eve, you expect to get something that you want. The hope, Jesus in us is the Christ in us is the hope of glory. This is what he offers us. Turn back to Luke chapter 16. Luke 16, verse 22. 
It says, And so it was, the beggar died and was carried by angels to heaven or Abraham's bosom. The rich man died and he was buried. Now, the beggar who died, he was begging. He had sores. He had not, no money. He had pain. He had discouragement. He had not reached nirvana. He had not reached peace. He had not conquered his problems. The Bible says he was carried to heaven by an angel. Imagine that. Imagine this like 19 foot, 975 pound angel with 47 foot wings. You're dead. And he just with his finger lifts you up. He's got 10 other people on his fingers. It, actually, he's got 40 fingers, so he's got all these people <laughs> and 97 toes. And he takes us to heaven. And, in, and on, during the trip, you wake up, and he starts talking to you. <laughs> and you understand him. You haven't reached Nirvana, but you're going to heaven. The rich man who had a cool life, he died and was buried. He went to hell, as we're going to see in a minute. Not because he was rich, by the way, because he didn't trust in God. Number three, it is hopelessly suicidal to view the process of salvation as repeated reincarnations until nirvana is reached. In Buddhism, Buddha believed, Buddha means enlightened one, he believed that you received your karma from your previous life. Your karma basically was the sum of your good and evil. If you had more evil than good in your past life, you will have a bad life. If you have more good than evil, you have a good life. And you kept reliving these lives until you perfected your karma and reached nirvana, which was everything was copacetic. And then once you achieved perfect peace, through trial and error over life after life after life, you were rewarded with nothingness. You cease to exist. You're done. Now, I have some questions for that whole philosophy. Several. One, I had to be incarnated the first time because you cannot mathematically have an infinite series of past events. Nothing can just go on forever in the past or the future. And so there had to be a first me, uh, incarnation number one. Are you with me? I was born. That was my first incarnation. Now, if negative karma comes from a previous life and I had no previous life, I think it would be safe to assume I had perfect karma when I was beginning. Are you with me? Well, if the goal is to die with perfect karma and I'm born with perfect karma, if I was able to maintain my original state of perfect karma, and believe me, by the way, I'm perfect, so why would I mess up? If I was able to maintain that, I would die perfect, with perfect karma, nirvana, and I would cease to exist. That is no fun. Why would I want to do that? In other words, if I'm living, I'm good, I'm perfect karma, and I got perfect karma, and I'm in nirvana, and, and I was able to maintain that state. When I died, I would be gone. I'm, I've achieved it. Now, and, and now, this is just me. This is mild. I'm not the smartest, you know, the sharpest tool in the shed, but I'm just thinking. If I know that if I maintain this perfect karma that I cease to exist and to nothingness, why would I want that if I have the option of coming back again? So why don't I mess up a little bit and have a pretty good life so I can have another pretty good life with, by somebody else. Okay? It doesn't make sense for me to, to, to eliminate myself. That's why I call it hopeless suicide. Now, here's the, other, here's the other theory, though. Let's say I was born with perfect karma. Well, if I mess up in my life and I have to be reincarnated to try to get it right again, if I couldn't maintain perfect karma when I was perfect to begin with, what makes me think I'm going to perfect myself with bad karma to begin with? How am I ever going to get it right if I couldn't get it right when I was right? Are you with me? 
If you don't, just I, I can't say that again, so you just got to have to get with that one. I was talking to this lady. Uh, she was a DJ. I was, I was doing a, a radio interview at this radio station to this radio lady. And we were talking about God. I was doing an interview about God and, and, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, what do you believe? She says, well, I believe in reincarnation. I, I don't remember if it was Buddhism, Hinduism, whatever, whatever it was. But she brought reincarnation. I said, you believe in reincarnation? I said, what does that mean? Because in Buddhism, there is no eternal soul. Reincarnation is that your elements are reorganized into another living being, but you have no soul, so there really is no eternal you. So my question is, what is it that's trying this karma thing, if it's not your soul, because you are your soul? That's a whole other twist on that. But I told this lady, I asked this lady, well, what were you in your past life? She says, I was a queen. I said, so let me get this straight. You were a queen, and now you're a DJ. It seems like you're going backwards. <laughs> I said, so tell me about what evidence you have that there is reincarnation. She said, deja vu. Deja vu is a French wor word for already seen. Deja vu is when you think you experienced something before. We've all had that. You meet somebody, I, I, I know you. I've been here. This happened. Well, in psychology, they don't know what deja vu is. They don't even hardly study it because it's just out there. But we all had it. But here's the theory on deja vu. Deja vu is you feel like you've seen somebody or you experienced something before. How do you get from there to a whole nother previous life that you had? Woo! Is deja vu real? Yes, we all do experience those have those experiences where we think we experience something or we think, excuse me, we think that we met somebody, but a lot of times it just simply ain't true. You ever meet somebody and say, I, I think I know you? And they go, no, you don't. <laughs> and you were just wrong? Guess what? You're just wrong. But let's think about deja vu logically. Let's say this lady was a queen in her past life. Okay, we'll give her that. Let's say she was a queen in, in England, because she wasn't a queen here, because we don't have queens. So, okay, so let's say you were a queen in England, and it had to be a different before you were born, because you couldn't be a queen now, because you're a DJ. So let's say you were a queen 40 years ago. Let's give her that. And let's say your deja vu experience is that you had deja vu that you were interviewing me in this studio. That's the deja vu experience. That's a, is that legitimate? That I feel like I, we've had this conversation before, me and you. That's okay. So you're telling me is that in your past life as queen, you experience talking to me in this studio. In other words, as your queen in, France, in England, somehow you left your queenhoodness for a day and came and you became a DJS and you were talking to me in this place. Do you really think that happened in your past life? And by the way, if you believe reincarnation, I was uh, an emperor in Africa <laughs> in my past life. So what I had to do was I had to also be in this studio as the emperor of the African nation back then when you were the queen posing as a DJ. <laughs> do you really believe that? Everyone say no. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, it is appointed for a man and woman to die one time and face judgment. You and I will die one time and then stand before God. You and I will die one time and stand before God. That's a fact. We have no evidence. You have no evidence that anyone has ever been reincarnated into another human or living thing. It is only your imagination that you think that happens. The Bible denies it, and the Bible discredits it, and it's only a theory of people who don't want to believe in this word of God. Let's read. It says in verse 23, I'm sorry, in, in, your, in your notes, number four, it's hopelessly suicidal to pursue salvation in your own power without acknowledging 
God. In Buddhism, there's some Buddhists that do not believe in God at all, and there's some Buddhists that believe that they are gods, but they are not to be worshipped. They do, by the way, appease evil spirits because they respect and fear them. But they do not worship a God. It's all about me. And we're going to see next week as we look at Scientology, the whole thing Tom Cruise is ranting and raving about. And some of y'all may be, ooh, Tom Cruise is in it. I'm going to go do that. Don't do it. And we'll see next week why. But it's all about me. It ain't about God. It's, I have no accountability to anybody but myself. Because it's all about what I can do. Oh, let me tell you, the Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man, but in the end it leads to death. Think about it. How many times have you made a decision in your own wisdom? It ain't, it ain't work out. Every day? The Bible says that we are all sinners. The Bible says our heart is evil and wicked, desperately wicked. Who could even fathom our own heart? The Bible says that God died on the cross for our sin and rose from the dead because he loves us. You know what's amazing? Is that none of us in here know our own wickedness. When you go home today, if you remember to do this, look in the mirror and say, you are more wicked than you know. You are. If I called you a sinner, you should consider that a compliment. For real. Because a sinner, all a sinner is is a condition. All I'm saying is that you're not perfect. But what is really true is that you are desperately wicked. Jeremiah 17, 9 says. That our heart is, we are yearning self-preservation at all costs. We are yearning to be noticed and acknowledged and to be number one and to defeat everyone else. We are yearning to have, have all of our selfish, carnal needs met on an ongoing basis at everyone else's expense. That is wickedness. That's us. You know what God says? I love you anyway. I love you so much I die for you. And now, and now I want to bless you with eternal life in heaven with me. You know, we get so mad when we see what we call wicked people getting blessed. That's not the heart of God. God says, I love to bless wicked people. Matter of fact, I love them so much, I die for them, and I want to forgive them, and I want to renew their heart. That's the, the hope that Christianity offers. Not nothing. Not ceasing to exist. He says, I want to give you eternal life. Let's look at our story. Look at verse 25. Uh, verse 24. The man in hell said, he cried out and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this place, in this flame. Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received good things. Likewise, Lazarus received evil things. Now he is comforted and you are tormented. There is nothing wrong with receiving good things. The question is, what are you going to do with them? What do you do with the good things God has given you? And by the way, everything you have that's good, God gave you. Even your face, your teeth. You ever see people with perfect white teeth? They don't do anything. They don't, they, don't, they don't have braces. They never had braces. They don't have to whiten them. They're naturally white. I hate that. Because <laughs> I don't have those kind of teeth. I look at my kids' teeth. My kids' teeth cost me so much money. <laughs> but my one daughter has perfect teeth. God gave that. Nothing you have. Your intelligence, God gave to you. Everything God gave to you. What are you doing with it is the question. Then he said, verse, verse 26, Besides, between us and you there is a great gulf fixed, so that no one who wants to pass from here to there cannot, nor can those pass from you to us. And this is what he said, the man in hell. I beg you, whenever you hear me raising my voice, which is the whole time, it's those three words. I beg you, I beg you. This is the man in hell saying to Abraham, I beg you, Father, that you would send Lazarus to my dad's house, for I have five brothers, that they, he may testify and tell them the gospel, lest they come to this place of torment. Here's what he said. Don't let them come here. Whether you've thought about it before or not, there is a hell and you do not want to go there. And let me say, take it one step further. 
You do not want your enemies to go there. Your co-workers to go there. I don't care what they've done to you. I don't care what kind of relationship you have with them. I don't care how well you know them. You do not want them to go there. And you and I have an obligation to save them. I was witnessing to a guy. We had a 45-minute argument. Argument, discussion, and I'll abbreviate it because of time. But he basically was saying that you as a pastor have no right to tell people about their religion. You need to let people believe what they want to believe, and you have no right to tell them that they're wrong. I says, wait a minute. If they have a right to believe what they want to believe, and I have a right to believe what I want to believe, which is that I have a right to tell them, why can't I tell them? That's my right. If you tell me I can't tell them, you're doing what you're telling me not to do. You're telling me what I have a right to believe. But I said to him, let me ask you a question. If you were going to go to hell, and I knew it, wouldn't you want me to tell you? Whether you believe it or not. Let me tell you something. Whether people think you have a right to tell them or not, it has nothing to do with what you should tell them. What you do with your faith has nothing to do with what other people say. It has to do with what God says. God says, please tell them. They just don't know. If you remember when you were 15 years old, you thought you knew everything about everything. And your mother, father, all that old-fashioned, they don't know anything about anything. They knew. You know, I have this ongoing thing. I have three teenagers in college and I tell my daughter stuff and then when it comes to be true I'm the kind of guy that wants to make sure she understands <laughs> and I said I ain't want to rub it in but I want you to know remember isn't that what I told you and the reason is not so I could be right it's so she can trust that I really am trying to help her and that and a lot of times we have to experience it on our own to believe it. You do not want to experience hell on your own to believe it. Because once you go there, you can't get out. No one can pray you out. We'll talk about that in a few weeks. No one can get you out. And there is no waiting period. There is no, like, lobby to hell where you can change your mind. Where it's only, like, 200 degrees. Look what he says. Verse 28, for I have five brothers that they may testify to them and tell them not to come to this place of torment. Verse 29, Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he says, no, Father, but if one goes to them from the dead, that's exactly what Jesus did. He rose from the dead. They will repent. He says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded from if one rise from the dead. Let me tell you this, my brothers and sisters. If you cannot accept the simple truth of the Bible, there is nothing else anyone can do for you. If you can't accept that the Bible says we're all sinners, the penalty of sin is death, and that death is physical and spiritual, and that spiritual death is hell. It's a place of torment forever where there's no second chance. If you can't accept the fact that Christ came and died, he's expressed image of the living God, the invisible God. He died on the cross to pay the price for our sin rose from the dead, and he's offering you a free opportunity to accept salvation. If that is not good enough, there's really nothing anyone can do for you. That's what he's saying. He's saying, we already told him. God had a perfect plan of salvation, and he had it perfectly communicated, and there's nothing else he's going to do. Now, most of y'all are Christians. Don't let this go in one out the other, because there's more to this story. It's, our, it's, it's, it's what the Bible requires us to do as Christians as far as witnessing and serving and tithing and praying and loving our enemies and forgiving people who uh, talk behind our back. Those same, those principles too are what we should be living by faith. Getting saved is only the first step. And living by those guidelines is also part of entering into heaven. Heaven is where a place where God is in control. Heaven is not this place somewhere way out there only. It's a place where God's in control. That's what makes it heaven. It's not that it's over there. It's the fact that that's where God's in control completely. And he has no, given no room for a sin. Well, well, guess what? When that happens here, you got heaven. <laughs> Here's what he says. Now I'll leave you with this. This morning you have to decide, do you want this offer of eternal life from God? Or do you want to take a chance and do your own thing? in your own power, hoping that one day you will poof and be gone. God says, no, 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 that's boring. 
let me, let me empower you with the Holy Spirit today that you may have victory today. Jesus says, the thief has come to steal and rob. I have come to give you life and give you life abundantly now. That even though all this stuff is drama is happening around you, you still have peace that surpasses all understanding in your heart. And that can happen. Let's all bow our heads and pray. Dear Lord, we thank you that you offer us an eternal hope, hope of glory. We thank you that you offer us a relationship with you that culminates in eternity in heaven with you, where you wipe away our tears, where there's no more pain and sorrow and death. We thank you that your hope is living. It's not dead. We thank you that You don't leave us alone to do it in our own power. That you empower us with your Holy Spirit. If this morning you realize, yes, I want that salvation. I don't want to try to do it on my own because I can't. I know I'm a sinner. I want Jesus to fill me with his Holy Spirit. To be my Lord and my Savior. If that's you this morning, and you want eternal hope, and expect and desire that you will be with God in heaven. Pray this prayer with me in the privacy of your heart. Pray, dear God, I believe I'm a sinner. I believe sin is wrong. That the penalty is death. Separation from you in hell. But I believe Jesus is Lord. And he died. Rose from the dead. And I believe he loves me. Jesus, please forgive me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I want to be born all over again, born spiritually, God in heaven. Thank you, Jesus. As our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, if you prayed that prayer, and this morning you're saying, yes, Lord, I surrender my life to you. Eyes closed, heads bowed. If you prayed that prayer and you're saying, yes, Lord, forgive me of my sin, I'm just going to ask you to stand up and acknowledge his forgiveness in your life. Right now, stand to your feet. God bless you. Stay standing, please. Good. God bless you. Stand to your feet. God bless you. Anybody else? God is saying to you, I love you, and you said, yes, Lord, here I am. God bless you. Very good. Stay standing, please. Good. God bless you. You've heard a voice. It says, yes, today is your day of salvation. Stand to your feet and acknowledge Christ's forgiveness in your life. God bless you. God bless you. Very good. Stay standing. God bless you. Very good. God bless you. Anybody else? Straighten your legs and your body will rise. Now as we welcome all of you who are standing, as we welcome you to the family of God, we're going to ask you to step out of your seat and come on down to the altar. Let's give them a hand as they come on down. Amen. <laughs> let's give them a hand. Come on, let's encourage them. Amen. The Bible says, the Bible says that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence not seen. And we all want peace, purpose, clarity in our life, <laughs> meaning. But where is it? This, you just got it. And you were just born, so you're like a little baby. Spiritually, you got to start learning the basics of the Bible. Walking with God like a little girl, holding his hand. I went and saw my brother, who just had a baby a year ago, so I saw my niece for the first time. She's like one and something, like this big. So I had to go in there and establish that I was the best uncle she'll ever have in her life. And I was flying her through the air. I said, you want to fly? Yes. And I would just take her by the feet and just fly her around. And she knows nothing. If I call today, this was like four days ago, she probably had no idea who I am. She has to learn all about life and love and forgiveness and right and wrong and lying and cheating. That's what you are right now. That's what we're little babies. And this is, this is the instruction book right here. And if you learn to walk with God and you learn to do what he says and, and live like him, your life will never be, you'll be, you have the best man you ever had. And he will bring you a man. It may not look like what you want. He may have teeth growing on his forehead and hair on his back. 
but he'll treat you so good. <laughs> Let's pray for them on that note. And then you're going to follow that brother right there, and he's going to take you to the room. We're just going to talk to you. If these are your family, they're going to be right in the lobby to the left in the room. I just want to talk to you about what you did. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for these young ladies, and we pray you bless them. We pray that you transform their life. We pray that they allow you to be God in their life. Not a good luck charm. God Almighty in their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Just walk that way, ladies, and give them a hand. Amen.